When you're running for office, your name is on the ballot. So why not have your website be your name? If your name is John Smith, you need a .vote web address that says www.johnsmith.vote. 2022 will come faster than you think. Visit GoDaddy today and kick off your new campaign with a new personalized web address. Welcome to another episode of Breaking Battlegrounds with your host, Sam Stone. Chuck Warren out of studio off in the sky blue yonder today. Right. But we have in studio with us, and we are so excited to have helping co-host the program today, former state legislator Michelle Ugenti rita Thank you so much for joining us. I'm happy to be here. And folks, as always, we have a fantastic lineup of guests for you today. Uh, in the it, towards the end of the program, in our final segment, we're going to have Dan McLaughlin continuing the conversation about the brag indictment of Donald Trump. But first up, someone I am very excited to talk to, uh, Dr. Greg Autry, clinical professor of space leadership, policy, and business in the Thunderbird School of Global Management, affiliate professor with the Interplanetary Initiative at Arizona State University. Uh, he has an um, folks. This guy has an amazing background at the convergence of science, space science, and commerce. We're really excited to have him on the program because, frankly, humanity is on the verge of, of a next great exploration, I right. think, that's going to totally transform, hopefully for the better, humanity. The frontier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Greg has also served on the NASA agency review team and as the White House liaison to NASA under President Donald Trump. So welcome to the program, Dr. Greg Autry. Hey, glad to be here. Sam, Michelle. Welcome. So Greg, tell us a little bit about your work and some of the things that you've been focused on. And then I want to get more specifically into what is the future in space for humans and also the, the kind of geo political conflicts that are going to be coming along with it. So we'll get into that in just a moment. But tell folks a little bit more about your background, because I, I think you have one of the most fascinating sort of resumes and, and experiences of, of people I've met in the last few years. Yeah, you know, if life isn't going to be interesting, don't do it. Uh, so I actually started out as a video game developer with a company I launched in high school. Uh, I owned a company that did a clinical uh, software development for, for Kaiser Permanente, programmed medical devices, uh, worked on some torpedoes at a Honeywell defense plant. Uh, and then I moved in. Uh, so you're saving people and, and snuffing them out at the same time. <laughs> uh, uh, um, <laughs> I, I put, I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> peace through superior firepower, Sam. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to snuff anybody out if everybody knows you can. Uh <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the Reagan maxim right there. Absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. Weakness invites aggression is the current maxim, I think. Uh, but we can get into that. Uh, anyway, I moved on to uh, teach entrepreneurship at the University of California, Irvine, after completing my MBA there, and then, uh, as well as macroeconomics. They convinced me to stay and do my uh, my PhD at Irvine. And an interesting thing happened. Uh, the professor that was going to be my, uh, my graduate uh, PhD advisor I uh, took the opportunity to go to Rice for a couple of years, and I ended up without an advisor. And uh, uh, Peter Navarro stepped up to uh, to be my PhD advisor. Uh, Peter and I had worked together and written together for some time, but then we began uh, teaching macroeconomics together. And we wrote a book called Death by China in 2010, um, which turned out to be really influential in resetting uh, American expectations of what that relationship meant. For years, we'd been sold that China is going to be our friend uh, in the global uh, marketplace. And uh, if we make them rich and powerful, they will liberalize and, and become good uh, good actors on the world stage. Well, of we, course, we made them rich and powerful. We did. And what we got was a rich and powerful authoritarian dictatorship that is now a uh, peer level of military aggressor. And, and I COVID. learned about this. And COVID, yeah. Let's not forget <laughs> and that. We yeah, th thanks, China. Uh, <laughs> so we warned about we warned about all that. Uh, got a lot of criticism in academia because academia loves uh, China for a variety of different reasons. Uh, not not least of which is the funding. Yeah, uh, yeah, the funding at both the uh, 
uh, institutional level and, and frankly, people who are individually co-opted with inappropriate funding, uh, but they, they own our higher education institutions. Another topic I could get into. We made a movie, uh, Death by China. It's on uh, Amazon Prime, if you look for it, narrated by Martin Sheen. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have to watch it. I, did, I didn't oh. know that had been turned into a movie. Yeah, it had. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed it. I was the producer on that. Peter directed it. Um, anyway, Donald Trump uh, endorsed the book. Uh, I had mailed off books to about 50 uh, influential people, and he was the one that showed the most enthusiasm for it. And uh, I went off to teach at the University of Southern California, where I uh, taught entrepreneurship, and I focused on, during this whole period, uh, studying the commercial space industry, which was emerging in Southern California at that time. Uh, people probably might have seen uh, the Virgin Galactic announcement by Richard Branson in 2005, mm -hmm. and SpaceX and Blue Origin were founded in 2003. That's exactly when I began to study that industry. So I became really well connected uh, in that industry early on when nobody took it seriously. I remember mm -hmm. going back to my school and saying, you know, uh, there's this commercial space thing happening. I'm studying it. We should do a course on this. And, and I got back the attitude, uh, no, no, no. Space is just for government. It's a military industrial complex activity. That's not an appropriate place to study entrepreneurship. And I'm like, I've met this fellow named Elon Musk, and, yeah. and I think you're going to hear from him one day. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, I, I, so, I, I think some people are hearing more from him these days than they want to. Why do they want to? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I can tell you, I spent some time with Elon and uh, an, an hour long interview with him. I saw the BBC just did that. I did one with him a few years ago. It's an amazing tour de force of conversational uh, entertainment and, uh, and gamemanship. Um, so anyway, um, 2016, uh, I get a call about, uh, joining the uh, NASA transition team, the agency review team, part of the broader presidential transition team. Uh, and I was pleased to run off to D.C. and help set our uh, current national agenda in space, uh, which includes the, the Artemis program, returning to the moon. Uh, we made the recommendation to re-stand up a National Space Council, which was done under the vice president. Vice President Pence uh, uh, ran that, and we made the decision to uh, uh, recommend a, a space force be created so that we can have a more focused approach to our uh, existing military space assets. Then I was asked to stay as White House liaison uh, in 2017, which I did for a short period before returning to USC. And uh, in 2020, uh, the president asked me to replace Jeff DeWitt, uh, who was the chief financial officer at NASA. Jeff, as you of course mm -hmm. know, was treasurer of Arizona before that and then has returned to Arizona politics. Uh, and so uh, I was nominated to be the chief financial officer at NASA. Unfortunately, uh, the Senate had a, a meltdown in 2020, and uh, Mr. O'Connell never scheduled a floor mm -hmm. vote on uh, my confirmation hearing. So I ended up not knowing where to go. I uh, was teaching, uh, doing some work at Oxford uh, for them uh, in, in the U.K. I had a kind of relationship with uh, uh, Imperial College there, where I'm a visiting professor now. Uh, I was uh, working with FIT, the Florida Institute of Technology, on a summer program at Kennedy Space Center, uh, International Space University, which is a, a French-based uh, well, group. Well, there's – I, I mean, before you, before you continue, because your, your resume is just beyond insane. I mean, quite frankly, it's not the kind of thing that pe folks who are listening to talk radio oftentimes get to hear from. I want to focus a little bit on – what is humanity's future in space? Where, where is this going? Because yeah. I, I, well, I, mean, I think the creation of the Space Force was insanely necessary despite the criticism. But but far beyond that, there is enormous opportunity out there for us. Yeah. So let me just finish that. So I wanted to start a, a space education program because I think the future of humanity is at a tipping point that is perhaps the most important one in all of our history. Uh, so I ended up at Arizona State University. I looked closely at Embry-Riddle, but mm -hmm. Arizona had a real interest in creating a cross of the university domain interdisciplinary space approach, and they do some great things there. And I was super impressed. Uh, my friend uh, uh, who ran the uh, Pluto program, the New Horizons program, Alan Stern, recommended me uh, to uh, Lindy Elkintat, who's a VP uh, at ASU, and I was really impressed with what was going on. So I joined the Thunderbird School of Global Management there where I'm running the first program to uh, uh, educate space 
policy and management leaders in a dedicated graduate program. And the reason is because we are at this moment that is, I think, the equivalent of the age of exploration, the, the 15th and 16th century. And at that moment in time, we could have ended up with a very different future. The Chinese, in particular, had a vast fleet of ships in the 15th century that were exploring the world. Uh, they went all the way from China into the Middle East and down the coast of Africa, uh, and they were going out in the Pacific. Uh, some people think they might have made it all the way to the Americas in, in early as 1420. Uh, that's not clear, but nonetheless, they were capable of, of doing that. They were doing trade with India uh, before the Europeans got there. And if they had continued that, and if the Europeans hadn't stepped up, we'd probably be living in a world where you and I would be speaking Mandarin. But what happened was the Europeans stepped up and uh, you know, began to explore the world and exported their culture, and the Chinese made the fateful decision to step back. There was the death of the third Ming emperor uh, who was promoting this program, and the, the bureaucrats in China basically said, we're not spending money on this anymore. Uh, and luckily... Uh, for Europeans, the European powers did. You know, they luckily the Spanish stepped up and, and funded Columbus, and, and we ended up with uh, a world where uh, we have the values uh, that we have today. Now, so what does the commercialization exact, of space kind of look like? That's what I want to really yeah. delve so anyway, into. The point I want to, we're now at the point where we're going to explore and expand into the uh, the solar system. We want to bring yes. the values of America and the Enlightenment with us, and it's super important we commit to that and stick with it, because if we don't, we're going to have the reverse of that, and we're going to end up with the, the communist Chinese government doing that. Um, what America brings to this is commercialization, right? Okay. So you've got people like Elon Musk building rockets cheaper, faster, uh, and uh, more productively than the government ever did. Uh, under the space shuttle, you flew once every two months, maybe, it costs a billion dollars or more a launch. It costs eighty thousand dollars a kilogram to put something in orbit. Uh, Musk is flying every week. It costs five thousand dollars a kilogram uh, to put something in orbit, and the the pace is increasing while the price goes down. This is creating a incredible economic opportunity for all sorts of businesses to access space in a way they couldn't. We we have just about a minute before we go to break here, Greg. Uh, what is the first area, and I, probably this is a longer answer, so we can touch on it more when we come back here, um, but what I want to get into when we come back is where are the first areas of commercialization? What is that going to look like? What sort of industries are those going to be? Yeah, well, we already have it. We just don't often think about it. So you're carrying around in your cell phone, of course, a GPS receiver, which is talking to GPS satellites, right? That's point. Uh, mm -hmm. Every fa factory in the, in the world is timed by GPS signals. Every financial transaction is timed by that. Uh, you're using it for communications. Uh, you're using it when you go to Google Maps and click on satellite view and, you know, look at uh, 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 the territory there. It's um, amazing to think how much that has changed in the last few years. We're going to explore that a little bit more with Dr. Greg Autry when Breaking Battlegrounds comes back in just a moment. Welcome back to Breaking Battlegrounds with your host, Sam Stone. Chuck Warren out of studio today. Thank you to Michelle Ugenti Rita for joining us. And on the line with us right now, Dr. Greg Autry. But first, folks, are you concerned with stock market volatility, especially with Joe Biden in office? What if you can invest in a portfolio with a high fixed rate of return that's not correlated to the stock market? A portfolio where you'll know what each monthly statement will look like with no surprises. You can turn your monthly income on or off, compound it, whatever you choose. There's no loss of principal if you need your money back at any time. Your interest is compounded daily, you're paid monthly, and there are no fees. This is a secure, collateralized portfolio that delivers a high fixed interest rate up to 10.25%. And by investing, you're actually helping students who are behind on their student loans get caught back up, get their lives back on track, fix their credit. It's a fantastic opportunity. Make sure you go to investyrefi.com. That's invest, the letter Y, then R-E-F-Y.com. Or give them a call at 888-Y-REFI-24. That's 888-Y-REFI-24. And make sure you tell them Chuck and Sam sent you. All right, continuing on with Dr. Greg Autry. Uh, Greg, when we went to break, we were talking about how space is already being commercialized. We see it in our lives every day. And what a change that is with GPS and satellites, all the things that are going on. want to touch more on that. What is the future of commerce and space 
And then obviously also the strategic implications right now, because even if people don't seem to recognize it broadly in society, we're in a new space race. We're back to, in some sense, the 1960s. We are. And what's interesting about the commercial part is that it has changed the whole paradigm. So space has always been a domain of of national defense concern, going Mm -hmm. back to when the the Germans developed the the first rockets with uh, Werner von Braun uh, and when the U.S. and Russian program started. But if you look at the war in Ukraine, Ukraine has been able to leverage commercial space assets to basically uh, uh, outperform the Russian governmental space assets. So they've used a satellite imaging from commercial companies like Maxar and Planet to track Russian troop movements and bridge building and, and do damage assessment of their own attacks. They've used Elon Musk's uh, Starlink system to uh, maintain command and control and allow people behind the lines to communicate where the Russians have attacked the Ukrainian Internet. Uh, this has not gone unnoticed on the Russians and Chinese, uh, uh, and they are going to have a hard time catching up with American ingenuity and, and commercial uh, uh, vigor. Uh, so this is our uh, our secret sauce that's going to let us win Space Race 2.0 versus the authoritarians. So that's, I think, an important concept for people to understand because everything that happens in China, even if it's commercial activity, is still government activity. Um, and it's, yeah. it's subject in some form to government control, which means it isn't as free to develop new technologies, develop new ideas as U.S. commercial commercial activity is. Yeah, and for a specific example, there's several commercial companies, they call themselves commercial, that are building rockets and launching them in China uh, and trying to get uh, even American companies to put their satellites on them. All of these companies are flying three-stage solid rockets on mobile uh, platforms that look exactly the same. And why is that? Because they're actually Chinese military intercontinental ballistic missiles that come right out of a Chinese government factory and are handed to these companies because China wants to create a commercial space industry. And and being the central planners they are, this this is the way they think they're doing it. These companies have 3D renderings of what they're going to build in the future, which are all copies of basically SpaceX rockets. But what they're flying now is ICBMs. Do you see real commercial travel into space? I know we've had celebrities and um, billionaires uh, launch themselves, you know, into space. But I mean, but do you see this on a on a regular kind of commercial level for the everyday uh, person? I do indeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and last year was kind of the tipping point. There, we saw SpaceX and uh, Blue Arch and uh, make real commercial flights for paying passengers. Uh, I actually know several people that were on several of those flights. Now, they were expensive, uh, but they're a lot less expensive than they were in the past. Would you and get on again, one of those flights? Oh, sure, in a moment. I don't now, think I that said, that it, it isn't without risk, but I served uh, as uh, an advisor to the Department of Transportation on their Commercial Space Transportation Committee at FAA, and I was the chair of the safety working group, the group that oversaw that issue and advised FAA on uh, ideas behind what they'll need to do when, when they uh, will have to regulate the industry eventually. So I'm fairly familiar with it. Uh, it's not riskless, um, but nothing fun is. Uh, I can right. kill myself ski- skiing, frankly. That happens all the time. I, would, I mean, so there's obviously a, a novelty and something spectacular about saying that you've been in space, but, but why would you, what would be the rationale of going into space commercially? Or do you, do you envision visiting places? Is it is it just to say that you're in orbit? I mean, I'm just curious what you think the future commercially looks like in the next 50 to 100 years? I know that's kind of yeah. looking far out, but sure. I think you kind of have to when you're talking about this level of exploration. Yeah, and, and, and it requires a long-term thinking that, uh, that the United States sometimes isn't so good at doing. Uh, we, we really need to think in decades. Uh, but right now, there's a huge demand for just, I want the experience of being in space. Right. It's cool, and, and there's a lot of people there. Uh, and the number will grow bigger as the cost comes down. I think eventually you'll be able to do this for $50,000, which is a lot of money, but uh, you know, it's the vacation of a lifetime. Um, but there's are people the are spending. Are you, are you landing on a planet? Or what, what are you doing? No, gosh, no, no, no. no. Uh, in most cases, you're doing a suborbital space flight, like Alan Shepard did, and you're going up for a few minutes okay. and seeing the Earth and from above, experiencing a few minutes of weightlessness and coming back down. Wonderful. Uh, in some cases, you're doing a few orbits or going to the International Space Station. Mm. Uh, Someday people will go to the moon. But the point being, uh, tourism and what we call sovereign uh, astronauts or, or countries that can't afford to build rockets and spacecraft want to have astronauts. 
So there's a lot of business, and American mm-hmm. companies like Axiom are lining up uh, customers from around the world, whether that's the Saudis or the government of Chile or Taiwan. Uh, you know, wants to send an astronaut, they're going to put them on an American commercial vehicle. Eventually, though, we're going to have point-to-point travel. You're going to be able to fly from Phoenix to uh, Tokyo in 40 minutes. There you uh, go. On a rocket that will go outside the atmosphere on a ballistic uh, trajectory and then come back down. Much like an ICBM, but with a peaceful purpose. <laughs> wow. I, I see ICBM with a better landing. There you go. <laughs> uh, and that will require some really interesting geopolitics to make happen, but it's technically very feasible. Obviously, if I can throw a large uh, payload with a bomb in it, I could, could also throw a, 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 an express FedEx package or, or some people in that direction. That's incredible. It, it, it's unbelievable how fast this started to evolve, really, when Elon Musk mm-hmm. got involved. But really, it's the commercialization that seems to be driving the technology at this point, um, much more so than government. Yeah, and it's not just Elon. To be fair, Paul Allen, Bill Gates' business partner, was heavily mm-hmm. involved in this before he died. You've got Jeff Bezos. You've got Richard Branson. And in my opinion, you have to think seriously. If you think that group of people are wrong, um, that, that, that's highly unlikely. Yeah, conservatives uh, may have their disagreements with some of those folks, but they're not stupid by any means. I mean, these are some of the smartest people on the planet. They aren't. And, and if you spend time with them, you'll find that they're kind of um, crazy, disruptive libertarians. I think most conservatives would probably like them more than they think. A lot of conservatives have suddenly realized they like Elon Musk more than they think because they've actually started listening to him instead of being told about him by somebody else. That's a, that's a great point, and to your former boss, it, that was, I thought, the difference when he won the 2016 election was that he got out in front and let people hear from him directly. It wasn't being Thanks filtered. Twitter. Right. And then the news got smart, and they cut him off <laughs> um, for the second one, and, and that really, I think, affected it. We're going to be coming back in just a moment with more from Dr. Greg Autry. Uh, for Chuck Warren, I'm Sam Stone. Michelle Lugenti Rita in the studio with us today. Jeremy in the booth. Jamie As always, our technology specialist, making sure all this comes out on time. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Breaking Battlegrounds with your hosts, Sam Stone. Chuck Warner out of studio today. In studio with us, Michelle Lugenti Rita, and on the line, Dr. Greg Autry. All right, Greg. So let's let's get into it. Why the average person person should give a damn about space uh, space exploration, about the commercialization of uh, space exploration. We left off with talking about the potential of traveling. What would take you know a day, several days, in a matter of hours. Um, to me, I think that's huge. But but let's dive into other things uh, that the average person would care about as it affects their lives. Yeah, uh, well, obviously, as I mentioned, we care about the national security issues and we care about carrying American values into the future of humanity. But the average person should care about jobs, uh, investment opportunities, uh, financial growth and great new products. And space offers all of that, uh, everything from uh, limitless, actually clean energy to uh, medical revolutionary devices that are going to extend and improve the lives of so many people. We can grow livers in space made from your own stem cells uh, so that you can have a liver transplant when you need it instead of waiting for somebody to die and not have to be dependent on immunosuppressant uh, drugs when you need that. Space lets us do that? Space lets us do that because when you try to grow an artificial liver on Earth, you get a liver pancake because of gravity. It doesn't grow into a three-dimensional organ. But in space, guess what? And we've, we're working on retinas to uh, replace the people who have things like macular degeneration to restore their vision, uh, cancer treatments. There are some amazing things medically happen. New materials that can't be made on Earth, like metallic foams and perfect crystals, fiber optic cables that are better. They're going to transform industries across the board and, and give us uh, uh, consumer goods that, that you can't imagine. So, and so there's you, going to be a lot of jobs involved in that. So you, you actually see a, a space manufacturing future right. coming. Yeah, it's called ISM, In Space Manufacturing. Um, and there's a lot of people working on some amazing things. They're testing them now on the space station with support from NASA in a program called INSPA, In Space Production Applications. But they're going to move to commercial space stations, which are going to be flying in the next couple of years. So that kind of begs... Mm-hmm, go on. 
yes, you're going to see America, I think, take over manufacturing in this new sector because nobody else is ready to do it yet. We really need to push that and maintain that uh, that competitive advantage. And, and that makes me think about ownership. Who owns space? How does? Oh wow! <laughs> do we have an hour? Um, I wanted to launch that you... question in the shortest segment. Yeah. I was told not to do yeah. that. <laughs> The U.S. signed under a, a treaty in 1968, which uh, is kind of a socialist view of space belongs to all humanity and you can't own anything or have sovereign territory. This is somewhat problematic. Uh, the U.S. since then has been working hard to interpret the treaty in a way that allows commercial companies to do what they need to do. But uh, we could do a whole segment on, on the complexities of that issue and the geopolitics around it. It's a huge topic. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's incredible how much this is going to become the next contest of great nations, mm-hmm. I think. Much, it, it absolutely is. What, how aggressive is China? How much are they putting into this? And how big a threat Super are Super aggressive. Super aggressive. And uh, the head of their lunar program has very clearly said that he recognizes that the Apollo program is what caused the U.S. to be the ascendant global technology power of the late 20th century. The Internet, the personal computer and the cell phone revolution, all these things stem from investments that were made in the space program and from engineers and scientists that were trained or inspired by it. And so they want to rep- they want to replicate that in China because they want to own the future of humanity and they want to take their totalitarian, authoritarian, anti-religious, uh, you know, anti-individual model uh, into to space to ensure that the future of humanity looks like it does in Beijing today. In this race, who's winning? In this race to commercialize space, we are, we are okay. absolutely. But that doesn't America, mean we can. Good. Uh, I, I'm wiping we, my we brow slow, right now. Slow down. Yeah, no, we we are far ahead, both in governmental uh, as well as military, and in our commercial sector, most right. assuredly. But we have to keep it up. Absolutely. Yeah, the, this is I Rush think our competition. Yeah, absolutely. our competition is is relentless, ruthless, and determined. We, we, we're going to uh, let Greg go here in just a moment. I've got to do a, another sponsor read coming up here. But uh, I, I really bring this back to the 1960s and the sort of sense of national unity that was created behind this mission to get to the moon. And, and I really think it's important that we start talking about recreating that. Maybe this is an area where left and right can start to agree again. We have mm-hmm. real opportunity. Uh, Greg and it was- it was an international agreement, too. Everybody respected America for that at a time where they didn't like us for a lot of other reasons. Love it. Greg Autry, thank you so much for joining us today. Folks, you can follow him on Twitter, Twitter at, at Greg W. Autry. Make sure you put the W in there. You're going to get the wrong person. Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. We thank really you. appreciate having you. Take care. Bye-bye. So, folks, are you concerned with stock market volatility? I am. My portfolio keeps bouncing up and down all over the place. Joe Biden is terrible at this economics thing. Don't trust him. Don't trust the stock market. Call my friends at InvestYRefi. Go to InvestYRefi.com. You can earn up to a 10.25% rate of return on a secure collateralized portfolio. Fantastic opportunity to secure your financial future. And hopefully we'll secure the U.S.'s future in space right about the same time. Breaking Battlegrounds back in just a moment. Welcome back to Breaking Battlegrounds with your host, Sam Stone. Chuck Warren out of studio today. In here with me, Michelle Legenti Rita. Thank you so much for joining us today, Michelle. My pleasure. I'm having fun. Uh, and on the line with us now, Dan McLaughlin, senior writer at National Review Online and a fellow at the National Review Institute. We had him on last week. We were talking about the first three pieces in a five piece series he has been writing about the Trump indictment in New York. What's that? I'm just joking. No, nobody's heard no about any heard such about that, thing. Right. There's nothing going on in the world. Who At can, all. Yeah, no. Uh, Dan, thank you again so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate having you here. Can you real quick recap the first three pieces, and then I want to get into the, the most recent two that you've done. Yeah, so basically, um, I mean, to recap, the, the Trump indictment, uh, at least the first Trump indictment, perhaps we should call it, uh, yeah, but yeah. the one we have so far. The, the Trump um, indictment that's landed already, there's there's more in the wings. Yeah, there's more that may be coming. But um, but this is the, uh, the Manhattan District Attorney, so it's New York state law. Uh, and essentially they've indicted him for uh, the hush money payments that were made by Michael Cohen, uh, Trump's lawyer to Stormy Daniels 
before the 2016 election uh, to cover up her alleged affair with Trump, um, $130,000. And, you know, Trump repaid Cohen. Uh, Basically, Cohen sent him invoices saying, you know, this is legal fees. Trump repaid him. He paid him twice as much, in fact, uh, as Cohen had laid out to Daniels in order that Cohen could um, list this on his taxes as legal fees uh, and pay taxes on it, which he should not have owed. So he overpaid his taxes um, and could then, uh, you know, overpay his taxes and not, you know, come out uh, having lost money for having done so. And and to some degree hide what the money was used for. Yeah, I mean the the theory, the legal the legal charge here, and we'll get to, into the details of that in a minute. The legal charge here is falsifying business records. So the argument is that the invoices, Trump's checks, and the recording of those checks on the general ledger of the Trump or, of various entities of the Trump organization uh, constituted false business records, uh, and and Trump has been charged with thirty four of those. So the first. Uh, the payments were actually made to Daniels in 2016 before the election. The repayments of Cohen were made throughout 2017. Now, the statute of limitations is five years for a felony or two years for a misdemeanor. Um, and so the first part of my series really discussed the fact that, look, all this stuff happened more than five years ago, certainly quite a bit more than two years ago. Um, so, you know, Bragg requires some fairly creative lawyering in order to say that this stuff isn't all barred by the statute of limitations. And if he can't prove that he's got a felony charge, if he just has a misdemeanor charge, uh, no amount of creative lawyering can save it. So the second part of my series dealt with the fact that, um, you know, what exactly is the felony here? Uh, and, and, you know, and, and Bragg never, never really says, but he seems to be trying to say that, that, these things should have been reported as federal campaign finance, uh, you know, that this is a federal campaign finance violation, that, that essentially this amounted to, um, you know, campaign expenditures. Uh, and, and so I sort of walked through some of the problems with that. And the third part of my series, I focused specifically on the fact that um, that the felony that, that, that supposedly was being covered up, because it's a federal law, felony, if in fact that is what Bragg is charging, um, you know, it, it may be something that the law simply doesn't allow Bragg to try to use a backdoor state law way to enforce federal law because, you know, he, the executive power of the United States is vested in the president and the attorney general and not the district attorney of the, of the county of New York. So, um, and, and the reason that, that, that covering up a felony is important, just to be clear, is that false business records are a misdemeanor. They become a felony if you show, in addition, that the false business records were done to cover up some other crime. So, you know, that that's kind of what I covered in the first three parts of my series um, and then got into sort of the last two big problems with this case. Yeah. Um, I, I want to start there. The, the, uh, and for folks, make sure you go to nationalreview.com and check these pieces out for yourself. Make sure you read them. So I, th- I think these are, uh, Dan, I think you've done some of the most thorough work explaining this and really getting into the meat of the subject here. Um, the ridiculousness of the Trump indictment part for the missing fraud. Yeah. So and again, I'm trying as best as I can to sort of wade through the legalese here and, and make it comprehensible to people who are not lawyers, which I hope I've done. But, you know, one of the things I, I'm the, not a the, lawyer and I got it. I'll, I'll Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that the false business records statute says is that, you know, you have to prove the defendant did this with intent to defraud. And the courts have additionally read into that because it's a traditional element of fraud, that the fraud has to be material. In other words, that you have to, like, it's not it's not material, for example, if you lied about, to somebody about something unimportant or if you lie to them about something where they know, they already know the truth, um, which is very often one of the problems that prosecutors have had going after Trump because Trump tends to puff up a lot of stuff to people who already see through it. Um, So it really is a question of where's the victim, right? Trump basically is accused of lying to his own checkbook. Uh, That's really what this comes down to, right? Because the invoices go to Trump, Trump writes checks, uh, they get recorded in the general ledger of what appears to be two accounts in the Trump 
organization that are just Trump's own money, so they're not like his operating businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the question is, how do you show that he had intended to defraud anybody? Yeah, he lied in his records because he was trying to cover something up uh, that he was embarrassed about. The whole point of making the hush money payments is that he was embarrassed about this stuff, whether it was political embarrassment, not wanting his wife to know, or some combination of the two. Well, that's, so, I, I want to I want to stop and touch on that point real quick, Dan, because there's been some reporting come out come out since actually I I, I saw it. I don't know if it came out before we talked to you or after, but uh, going back that this had actually been published published many years earlier in a small paper in I think it was like Alabama or something like that 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 all this had come out and Stormy Daniels had apparently been telling this story to people about Trump for many years. Yeah, although the simple fact is, I mean, he did he did pay her one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, so he was trying to keep her from, you know, put it poking this up into somewhere where it would catch national attention. Um, and and look, obviously, a guy with Trump's history, uh, there's going to be people telling stories, and some of those stories are going to be true, and some of them won't be. Um, but the the essential problem here is that you know when you say intent to defraud. You, like all I you know I looked through all of the cases that where there where the courts have ruled on prosecutions under this statute and they're always looking at like you know it's it's either it's a business putting this in some sort of you know either either somebody's doing like an insurance fraud or benefits fraud where they're actually submitting a false document to somebody or it's like you know cops and nurses who are misreporting things in their log books that are intended to conceal stuff from their own employers there's a variety of different fact patterns, and even uh, you know, even the one time when they they used this in a prominent campaign finance case under state campaign finance law, they were arguing that not that it was you know some secret record, but that that the uh, Brooklyn assemblyman actually had an a, an obliga- a legal obligation to file something under state law that he didn't do, which is not the theory that's charged here. So, one way or the other, if Trump it's just lying in a private document that he didn't intend anybody to see. I don't see how legally this can stand up as, as an intent to defraud case. I mean, and, and, you know, people might say, well, why would you ever lie in a private document? But people do that. Um, you know, I mean, if you're like, if you're, if you're running, let's say you're, you know, you're, you're running some sort of classified national security operation, you might, you might, put code words for things in your documents, not because you're trying to lie to somebody, but because you're worried that if this thing leaks, somebody might find out the name of your informant uh, or the, the details of some weapons system. You know, I used to do mergers and acquisitions cases occasionally when I was in legal practice. And if you had a company that was trying to take over some other company, you write a legal memo to your client, which is intended to be private, privileged, confidential. You would still use code names. Bankers do this, too. You use code names for the companies, not because you're trying to defraud anybody, but because in case this memo gets mislaid and somebody sees it, you know, you don't want them to figure out what company is trying to buy some other company. So it's it, just lying in a private document that you never intend anybody to see. I don't see how that stands up in court as intent to defraud within the meaning of the statute. Yeah, it seems like it's really this case has been stretched as far as they can possibly creatively take it at this point. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's one thing to say, well, you're stretching the statute of limitations or you're stretching, you know, certain like issues of federal state relations. Those are important legal questions and and some of them have important consequences. But He's also stretching to make the crime at all, right? So it, it, if he doesn't show intent to defraud, he's got no crime. Yeah, it's, it's to me that has been the issue, the central issue to this the whole time. Who's been harmed by this? Who's the victim? Other than Melania, I mean, I, right? Well, there there must have been, obviously there was a rationale for why he did pay off Stormy Daniels. So, but the real question, I guess, is is that illegal? Is there some kind of Ill- illegality with with that um and there's a couple different courts there's a court of public opinion there's the actual court and that ma- makes me want to ask a question do you think he can get a fair fair trial um i mean it's it's it is hard to get i mean first of all you know in theory you want a jury of people who are unfamiliar with the defendant which That's is almost uh, he has I to go to space 
Right. right. I'd be afraid to go in front of a jury of 12 people in the United States of America who have never heard of Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> there are, <laughs> there are such people, but... I've never heard boy, of them. Yeah. Boy, that's a great um, point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're just going to have to, you know, I, look, I'm sure there's going to be a huge fight over, like, jury selection. Like, you know, can you find any, you know, are you allowed to ask them who they voted for and all that sort of thing? I mean, it's it's sort of, but it's sort of, I mean, that is an issue that comes up in political cases all the time, though. Um, what is unusual is that, I mean, the, the strategic disadvantage often that happens to Republican politicians uh, is that typically these cases you know, even with like a senator or a governor who represents a red state, often the the big prosecutor office that will go after somebody is in the bluest part of the state, the city, right? And so, absolutely, you know, that can be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dan, we we have just about two minutes left before we get to the end of the program. Here, I want to touch on the the fifth column in the series, the uh, the indictment itself, part five, the indictment itself. Tell folks what yeah. that's about. Yeah. So there's 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 Two different legal problems. I won't get into all the weeds of this, but but with the indictment, which boiled down to, on the one hand, it takes the same crime and breaks it into too many different counts, right? For example, uh, you know, on February 14, 2017, Cohen sends an invoice, Trump writes a check, it gets listed tw- in two places on the general ledger, and they charge that as four separate felonies. I mean, that's <laughs> ridiculous, it's like charging him for every zero on the check, right? <laughs> but... Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you're going to be able to, like, give notice to the defendant uh, and manage the case and even figure out for double jeopardy purposes whether the jury is unanimous and all, you have to charge – you not only shouldn't charge the same crime in too many different counts, you also can't try cr- charge too many crimes in one count. And that's the problem with Bragg not saying what crime he thinks Trump was trying to cover up, right? Because – he, if, if he's throwing a bunch of different theories at the wall, Trump doesn't know how to defend himself against them. He, he could be surprised at trial. And if Bragg throws out a bunch of different theories, uh, he could end up with six jurors thinking one thing, six saying another, and you've got a jury verdict that looks unanimous but really isn't. So there are Fifth Amendment problems with both of those things, some restrictions on them in, under New York law. So, you know, I think that is yet another problem that Bragg has uh, legally. Yeah, I, I would tend to say that they're getting into a place with this case where almost no matter what, the outcome gets appealed by either side. And this one's going to not stop um, with the jury decision. But I want to thank you for coming on again today, Dan McLaughlin. Folks, you can follow him on Twitter at Baseball Crank. Obviously, check him out at National Review Online, doing fantastic work there. Dan, thank you so much for joining us, folks. Breaking Battlegrounds will be back on the air next week, but be sure to tune in for our podcast-only segment. Michelle and I are going to bounce a few things back and forth and be uh, download, share, like those podcasts. Those are, those are the lifeblood of radio these days. We really appreciate you tuning in every week. Breaking Battlegrounds will be back on the air next week. Welcome back to the podcast-only segment of Breaking Battlegrounds. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in, downloading, subscribing to this podcast. We really appreciate it. Uh, fantastic discussions today, Michelle. Loved it. Yeah, no, those were really good stuff. I thought I thought Greg Autry, you know, it's so interesting. I think a lot of times radios, radio podcast shows like this, we spend a lot of time talking to politicians or people who are covering politicians or working around politics. Um I always find it fun to talk to somebody who isn't really directly involved in that world, but is involved in business, commerce, industry, entertainment, something where their their expertise goes far beyond what we find in politics most days. Absolutely. But ultimately, it's going to boil down to politics because, right? I mean, because all of that is going to need to be sorted out politically. Um, so in your, and it's going to be regulated, highly regulated, and the, the people in those industries are going to want to be protected by government. It's all going to be political. Now, I got to say, I'm with you. I, I, would, I would sign up for a space flight if I was going somewhere. Like if I get to go to a space station and spend a couple of days on it, I'm in. Actually, I'll take that risk. Uh, to be honest, 
you couldn't pay me ten million dollars to get on a, a rocket ship, and if I need to feel weightless, I'll jump in the pool. Well, not not to give away too much because we're definitely never supposed to uh, bring up a lady's age, but I think you and I are about the same generation. Yes. Which means we grew up in the need another seven astronauts era of NASA. Um, with the Challenger, to, you know. Oh, I do remember that. Yeah, yes. right. I yes. think I think for for our generation, that really sort of scarred space for a lot of kids. Oh my god! Like folks don't remember, they had every classroom in America because you had Christy McAuliffe, right. a teacher, who a was teacher. on that flight. There's some teachers I could think about. I'd want to put on that. We've read for Ed. I've got a few here. Can we? Can we? How many Wait a people? Minute. Can how they many take? spaces? Yeah, right. Exactly. How many seats do they have? Um, but yeah, no. I think that really scarred a lot of people from our generation because literally they had every classroom in America live tuned into this thing when Watching the Challenger it blew live. up. Oh, it was horrific. Yeah. I mean, what I thought was interesting was the science component when he brought up the. There's a the growing liver? organs in space, livers and eyeballs. Right. That's amazing. That's a sci-fi movie if I ever. And you never one. think about the difficulty of doing that kind of thing. People have talked about, you know, or creating organs from existing DNA right. for people, but I would have never thought about that. You know, you end up with a a pancake instead of a functioning organ. That's right. No, it was very fascinating and I love how we ended it, which was America is dominating right now and we need to keep it up and that's exactly the position that we need to be in and that's what we do best we thrive under pressure and i'm excited to see what unfolds in the next couple of decades that's that's not a story you hear enough Mm -mm. no it's inspiring that's right i think the other thing too and and i've actually been taking i know this is kind of tangential but i've been taking some solace in what's going on in ukraine in terms of the technology imbalance between us and the russian forces Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the Ukrainians are essentially being fighting with a tiny fraction of U.S. technology, technological right. warf- warfare capability. And yet that's still far too much for the Russians. And the Russians and Chinese share a lot of commonalities in their military mm-hmm. tech still. So I think that I think that's actually good news, regardless of what anyone thinks of the Ukraine conflict. Well, and this is your exact and this is what we should be talking about. And this is what should be dominating Twitter and not, you know, men playing in women's sports, unfortunately, uh, that's occupying way too much attention because it's outrageous. But this is an inspiring story. He was very um, his resume is compelling. I felt I just wanted to put my resume in a drawer. (laughs) No, look, I I, I take take one look at a resume like that (laughs) and I'll feel inadequate for the rest of the weekend here. I mean, this is going to be terrible. I like to travel, (laughs) you know. Right. (laughs) I I once built a volcano at a science fair. Right, I know. Exactly. Baking soda volcano. (laughs) Right. Right. I think that's impressive. I do. Now, I mean, this was... It's it's interesting when you talk to someone like that because they're operating on a different level than mm. so many of the people that we meet and interact with in a day. Great. You know, one of the things I had talked to him in the past, which I found really interesting, is he had a, a student out at I, I think it was USC, but they created from um, from the leftovers, the cuttings from the both SpaceX program and from NASA and some of the military stuff that cut graphite parts. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're cutting and molding this graphite for all these rocket ships and so forth and so on. They found a way to take those and use them and to make them graphite nanotubes to, to run faster computers. Okay. We need people I mean, like that. Yeah, right? no. Like, I mean, this is, this is amazing stuff when you see this. I probably got that story entirely wrong. It's been like a I year like the since way you told it to me. I like the way you said it. It sounded... It sounds good that way, right? I'll if I'm right it. or wrong, I don't know. Eh, it's radio. But, but I, I love hearing stories like that. And I do think on our side as Republicans right now, because there's... We're sort of cross-cultural war right now with the education systems, right? Well, we're at we're at war with the institution, right? You know, not not with educating children and wanting to push, um, you know, our generations to make sure that they, you know, aspire uh, to whatever level that they want to in terms of their um, educational endeavors. But we are at war with the bureaucrats. Uh, who are running the, the are universities running the exactly. and doing, yeah. And and one of the things I think we, we forget sometimes is how valuable those research universities are. are. I know, I know. It's, 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 it's a good point. 
there's a lot of there's been a lot of negative commentary on uh, and well look at just how universities have been behaving lately. Oh, they, they they're out of control. I mean, it's you know the, these DEI driven bureaucracies are insane. But that doesn't take away from how important their their missions are and how important higher ed is and how important it is um, to feed these hungry minds as they you know go on to make things, develop things. I mean, we we need that in a sophisticated, thriving culture and society. Yeah, Greg Greg brought up that the, you know, the the moon the mission to the moon essentially Apollo all that drove our technological dominance of the last right. 50 years. But I think a big part of that also was all those research universities we have been the leader in university level research massively so. I mean, right. you know, nobody has a network of universities in their country that comes yeah. anywhere close to what we do. And one of the things, I know I'm kind of all over the place with this today, but it ties into something, I think, in immigration that, we, again, on our side, we need to start paying attention to yeah. and being a little more nuanced. When we're bringing people here for these scientific positions, we need to vet them carefully mm-hmm. But then we need to give them the opportunity to stay and contribute here as American citizens and not send them back to China in any else. With all else. of their, you know, wealth of knowledge and that, educational right. expertise that we help, you know, in, that we invested in. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's American taxpayers right. and American ingenuity that created that opportunity. And yet too often we're sending those folks back home mm-hmm. to use what mm-hmm. they've learned against us. Mm-hmm. And I think we've got to start thinking about the world as a competitive marketplace, you know, militarily, economically, in every area once again. I think the ideas of this sort of happy all one world, which were really kind of dominant in the 80s and early 90s, I think we've gotten some reality checks about that. We need to attract the best, the best and brightest, and then keep the best and brightest. Yeah. Whether that's here, you know, locally, nationally, but definitely internationally as well. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I like about this program and, and having Greg on. So we're on the air here in Arizona, in Florida, in Texas, in Colorado. Those are actually kind of the leading space states I was just right say now. That. That's right. I mean, it's been Arizona's really taken. A huge Florida is obviously the longtime leader in that Texas with SpaceX, but Arizona right now is coming up like a rocket. We are. Mm-hmm. No pun intended, but I like that dark skies. We are. That's that's I absolutely for our intended that pun. Did Michelle. you? I lo- <laughs> yes, I did. And I loved it. <laughs> that was great. Now let's finish up with Trump. The Trump and Diamond. Yes. What did you think? Well, first, I love what Dan has done with these pieces. Broken it out yeah. so you can understand it. Yeah, I think, and I wish everybody in the country would take the time to read his five pieces left and right, because they're not political. Mm-hmm. They're really just kind of a statement of facts. And obviously, he's a former attorney. He knows what he's talking about here in the way that most of the press does not. Look, this I, I think this is a joke, this indictment of Trump in New York. And if you're a Democrat, what, what kind of gets me is like, why would you want this, which is such a farcical indictment, when you have cases that at have least more merit on, yeah, its, on its face, or at least might have some merit? Something. I mean, there might be some meat on those bones. I don't know. I've heard the conflicting stories, and I'm not an attorney. I can't say. It really has jumped the shark. Um, and I think it's hit a lot of Americans. Did you see? I forget who the the um, the president was that tweeted. I think one of the Latin American presidents or African presidents tweeted out something about it and just said, you know, if this happened in any other country in the world, what would they be saying? What would the people in the U.S. be saying about it? Where the chief political opposition running for president is being indicted on political charges, and then he followed up and said, America can't lecture the rest of the world on democracy anymore well yes we can but um (laughs) we can and we will yeah right exactly (laughs) so that aside uh um the the point that uh he was making is you know is an astute one i mean you would you'd be calling it a banana republic right because it, it looks like you've got a political agenda uh pushing behavior you know with um the ag's office in a way that has nothing to do about uh, with upholding the law and everything to do about getting at your political yeah, opponent. Yeah, if, if Alvin Bragg had made his announcement wearing a really ugly green jacket with giant shoulder boards and 73 medals he didn't earn, it would feel far more accurate and appropriate. Right, 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 exactly. 
we celebrate that for whatever reason. Yeah, un- unreal. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure. Anything else you want to chat about talk with our audience? Before I mean, we go? I don't know. I mean, I just for me right now, what what is dom- dominating uh, my thinking is. is is this women's sports bananas. I'm glad you bring that up. I want to talk about it because yeah. it's so outrageous. It's it's so mind-blowing that we even have to discuss it, frankly. Because there are some things you think that are just obvious, and I thought gender was one of them. You would think. I mean, it seems like about so one old of fashioned. the most— It seems like one of the most obvious things on the planet. I mean, here's the thing. I, nobody is actually complaining. I, I mean, no— no one would actually sign up for this, essentially. But no one's complaining about a female, gen, you know, biological female who wants to transition or, or pretend. I don't I mean, right. I'm not big on this stuff. But to be a male and wants to compete with males in sports, mm-hmm. good luck. Well, that's the thing. The, the environment takes care of itself because you can't stay. You wouldn't be competitive. No, you get slaughtered. Right. Right. So but you have these men who are fringe competitors. Right. Who all of a sudden now are dominating in the women's in women's sports. sports, and it's all over the place. When the first couple examples of this, and I I talked about this a couple of years ago when we had those Connecticut runners, right? Who both were ranked in like the three hundreds in their state, right? Like these are these are low these are back of the pack boys who go to go transition. I'm, I'm using air quotes here, folks. Mm-hmm. You can't see it, but I'm using air quotes. Transition into girls. And now they're number one and number two in the state of Connecticut. And they've got scholarships that are taken away from actual women to go to university to run. And we have institutions that are condoning this. this that's mind boggling to me. And the, the athletes, the female athletes, the soccer player, well, Megan Rapino, and these. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? You know, I said this, I I put out a a tweet to this effect, but I think it's up to women to handle this situation, even though I think everyone should be appalled. Um, We have to boycott events uh, where this is condoned uh, because it is a matter of fairness and uh, this goes against... Uh, biology this but this goes against uh, competition because competition is based on you know similar people at, at similar levels competing with one another and obviously there is a a physical advantage males have and so to ask the public to somehow ignore that well I mean for example every so often like the U.S. women's national soccer team will play like the under 17 boys and just get annihilated Right. Right. Like there it's isn't a watch. There isn't a WNBA mm-hmm. team that could beat a top high school but men's team. Right. right? Like the, the a top high school men's team would slaughter the WNBA champion. And that's obvious to anyone who watches this. That doesn't mean women's sports is not worthy of having and watching and supporting and enjoying. Ab- well, absolutely. I mean, but it's there's something deeper going on. There's just the unfairness component uh, to our athletic system. Um, But then there's like this okayness with ignoring facts and, and science and what actually is, you know, the, the truth is not something that's subjective. You know, facts are not subjective. They exist. And everyone is acting like you could just make up what you want. And and that's a real problem for the fabric of our society yeah, and on a larger scale. It's insane. I mean, this this idea that facts don't matter, right. feelings, or, you know. I identify right. or my truth, whatever that means. No, the, the truth truth is truth. Facts are facts. That's right. Whether you agree with it or not, it, 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 it's, it's not, it's not any more valid because you don't agree with it or agree with it. No. It exists outside of you. We'll let that be the last word. That was perfect. (laughs) Folks, Breaking Battlegrounds, back next week. Running for office? You need a campaign website. Introducing the web address of the democratic process, .vote. So how do you purchase your .vote website? Visit www.yourname.vote. Type your website name, example www.johnsmith.vote. It's available. Add your web address to your cart and check out. 
Once checked out and have received confirmation, you may begin to create and utilize your website to connect and engage voters. To learn more, visit get.vote. Happy campaigning!